Jai Hind. Uh, today we have with uh, us Kanal Amrath Avasti, retired. He's an alumni of National Defense Academy, Defense Services Staff College, and Hartman Post. Apart from that, he has been an alumni of prestigious Indian School of Business. Apart from having two and a half decade of uh, Indian Army exposure, he does have a exposure in the corporate sector also. While in the service, he commanded his own regiment as the varied staff tenures in the Army headquarters, instruction in the School of Armor Warfare, and two United Nations mission tenures. An accomplished public speaker on the varied national and international events. He frequently visits the policy forums, institutes of eminence, as well as he is an avid columnist uh, and regularly publishing his opinion pieces in the and policy articles in various. Uh, articles, various journals on the semiconductors and geopolitics and critical technologies. As of now, at present, the officer is the vice president of premier industry body in semiconductors and he is steering semiconductors and ESDM policy to increase engagements at both center as well as with the six Indian states. He regularly interacts with the MEA, Ministry of Industry and Commerce, and many other ministries in the country to propagate detailed interactions and academia and regular uh, regulatory bodies, particularly on the subject of the semiconductors and in the field of uh, electronic domain, critical electronics domain. He's an avid speaker on this particular subject. Now, without much ado, I further hand over to Kanal Anurag Avasti. Morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Jan Ashok, everybody at St. George. For the opportunity, I will be speaking on this topic on emerging technologies in national security. Semiconductors as a focus to give you an expose in the next around 40 minutes. Leave the flow for around 15 minutes or some questions and answers, which can be done. And thereafter, we will call it a day. Having said that, let me just start straight away firstly as to what exactly are the emerging technologies and what are we speaking in so far as the national security is concerned. Next, please. So there are three basic themes which I look at in so far as the emerging technologies are concerned. These themes have to be very clearly defined. The first theme is the engineering prowess which is based on the aspects of security, reliability, and best practices in the industry. The second theme is acceleration of growth, which looks at initiatives, opportunities, technological risks, which are correlated with economic risks. It's very simply to say that technology is politics. Whether we like it or we don't like it, it may look like a very cliche statement, but technology is politics in today's world. And the third technology theme or the emerging technology theme is sculpting change. That is, all risk will be mitigated by accepting change and embracing disruptive technologies, as we've seen in the past, how things have come and how you're making things which are essentially anti those things. It started with a tank and you got anti tank, now it's drones, you're making anti drones, and what have you. So essentially, it is sculpting change. Next, please. Having said that, let's first look at what are the global drivers of change before we get into the emerging technologies. So you have the global, global power competition. You are seeing there's a lot of demographic pressure. You're looking at climate change. You're looking at economic transformation. You're looking at energy transition. You're looking at connectivity and the age of tech giants, all these Googles and Microsofts and what have you. You're looking at a massive issue of urbanization. You're looking at internet proliferation. You're looking at renewable energies, weather migrations, expansion into shared domains, you're looking at space, including debris as well as space crowding, and you're looking at the famous water. Now, all of this gave rise to whether they're critical technologies or their knowledge sharing manpower or cyber security or materials or supply chains or cartels, if, if for a want of a you know better word, price hegemonies and weaponizations for people to pick sides for competition. All of this is today hinging on technology. All these things are hinging on technology, whether they're emerging, whether they're in the pipeline, whether they have reached crucial, whichever way it is. Next, please. So when you look at the global security spectrum, you look at the core of all weapon systems, you're looking at RFICs, 
radio frequency integrated circuits. You're looking at monolithic microwave integrated circuits, also referred to as MMICs. You're looking at FPGAs, the heart of all the science. You're looking at drones, AI, ML, all of that. That entire slide is showing you all of that. This basically is the overall global spectrum. And this essentially is looking at the global interdependence of countries, as well as looking at various issues of dual use technologies. Now, dual use technologies, while it may look very fancy and sound very good, it has its own problems. It has its own problems of proliferation. It has its own problems of regulation. It has its own problems of understanding it and its own problems of acceptability. Next, please. So when you are looking at transformation and technology trends, you are looking at KI, how it is going to be doing all that. You're looking at advanced defense equipment networks as the future relies on whosoever has secure networks will rule the world. Whether it is autonomous systems, whether it is systems or systems of systems or vehicles or whatever you have. You're looking at communication systems of 6G. China has already lost a satellite in 2020 on 6G, which will give you a higher frequency, higher capacities, low latencies. You're looking at something called the mosaic warfare, which is a network warfare. It's a nice fancy term which is used. Internet of military things. You're looking at robotics. You're looking at supercomputing facilities, immersive technologies, additive manufacturing, space applications, specialist vehicles, intelligence. Intelligence in three basic paradigms. The carbon intelligence, the silicon intelligence, and the quantum intelligence. Intelligence also now has three paradigms. And of course, then you're looking at the metaverse, and deep learning applications, be that as it may. In addition, we have something called the DIY or do it yourself warfare. I saw Akshay, Akshay Tupadhyay also joining on this call. I think he's written a wonderful article in Brooklyn uh, on DIY warfare, which looks at the three C's. That is the computing, the connect, as well as the collaborations. So that itself. Now, when you look at all of them, ladies and gentlemen, all of them hinge on that famous chip or that semiconductor chip, whether it is an AI chip, whether it is whatever chip, everything hinges on that chip. So all your transformation and technology trends finally have a fulcrum on the chip. Next, please. Now look at this sand to silicon system. Just look at, it is one of the most complex things known to man, most complex procedure known to man. You have, a customer's application idea, you have the IP or the SOC development, which is basically on a developing board. You have something called the EDA tools, which are the repository only of a couple of three or four companies in the world. Nobody else is able to get them or produce them. Then you have the pre-silicon validation, which has its own labs. Then you have the design layout. And this is one segment. This is the design of the fabulous segment. And then of course, you have the sand or silica, make the ingots, you make the wafers, you have a fabricated wafer, you process it, you dice it, you package it, you test it, product, uh, assembly it, and then after put it in any electronic system in the world. Now, having said that, when you're looking at this entire mosaic of fabulous and fab and packaging of leak ATMP, assembly, testing, marketing, uh, marketing and packaging, it is essentially looking at nearly 350 to 400 processes. It is looking at continuous Water, it is looking at continuous uninterrupted power, a massive carbon footprint, and you're looking at one chip traveling three times the earth circumference of the earth and reaching wherever you want it to be. That is the complexity of the system. And that is why it is the most complex endeavor known to man. Next, please. Now let's look at this famous silicon chessboard to give you a little bigger picture and the flavor. Right. When you look at the red star on the uh, on the United States of America, it looks at all the equipment, the equipment which is used to manufacture these chips all over the world. 50 to 55 percent of equipment is manufactured in the United States. The IPs are more than 72 percent. The health of the United States. Then you come down to the blue star. That is, you are looking at the Netherlands or the ASML which has monopoly over the lithographic machines. All over the world, nobody else makes them, nobody else gets into them. In fact, I would urge you to also Google something called 
project Beethoven, which has now necessitated the Dutch government to tell the SML not to leave the shores of the Netherlands. Then you look at the blue star back in Asia, that's China, the packaging powerhouse. Most packaging is done there, along with most of the rare earth productionization in the world. And then, of course, you look at the Southeast Asia, including Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, and everybody else, where all the foundries are, all manufacturing is done there. Now, add on to this COVID, add on to that, that, that blast of the Ukraine war, which is going on for now two years and one month, add on to that the Israel-Hamas war, add on to that various other issues of the supply chain which move around all over the oceans, and it is a recipe for disaster. So thereby, while it is all spread all over the place in simple parlance, this becomes geopolitics and does not become plain technology. It's as simple as that. And be that as it may, semiconductor manufacturing requires more than 50 plus of equipment and 150 odd chemicals and 30 minerals across the manufacturing value chain. Now you see how complex is the system. So nobody says and nobody can ever say that, look, I have complete hegemony over one system. And when you don't have hegemony over one system, there are issues of trade tariffs, there are issues of price, there are issues of sea lanes of communication, there are issues of politics, there are issues of geography, there are issues of various other issues. And that's how it becomes more of a chessboard and more of a geopolitics and nothing more than that. Next, please. So let me tell you a couple of things very, very simply, since there's a lack of time and I'm already looking at the watch. I have a meeting to catch up at 12, so I have to leave a little early. So I look at the Troy pump, which is required for semiconductor manufacturing. So the first one, as I mentioned to you, is equipment, which is used for fabrication facilities and the ATMP or the OSACs. Then you have the materials, like the chemicals, gases, and minerals, which are used for the manufacturing process. And of course, the services all along the manufacturing supply chain. Now, how does it work out at the end of the day? Next, please. Right. So when you look at equipment, these OEMs are the heart of a manufacturing ecosystem. When you're looking at applied materials, you're looking at LAM, you're looking at KLA, all of them, most of them are American based. Now they play a role in supplying an integral supply system to the foundries. And obviously, since they run the show, they dominate and control everything. You may put in a lot of effort and you may put in a lot of facilities, but if the equipment gets delayed, because of various issues, then there's a problem. And every single day, you're losing money. So equipment reigns supreme in the product. Next, please. When you look at materials, you're looking at quality and purity of these materials. You're also looking at manufacturing materials. How do they come? But there's a lot of global chemical uh, industries presence in India. The Indian chemical industry is sixth largest in the world. It gives 7.5% to the Indian GDP, which is beyond 3.2 trillion today. So there are leveraging of capabilities of this industry now, as we look at it, as I look at it, and I do, as I do it, for making things which are semiconductor grade products for the system to take shape. Indigenization issues of gases, critical to set up these qualification and quantification labs and companies for these chemicals and minerals, and require own supply chains to avoid any geopolitical turmoil in future. The last point is of rare earths, which is not very, very uh, you know, overwhelming, but is relevant. Now, in terms of rare earths, India has 6% of rare earths all over the world. The Chinese have 60%, Malaysians have around 7%, some, some are there in Australia, some are in Bolivia, all of that. We're all aware that lithium has been lately found in JNK, which is, now, another challenge as to how do you process it? Do you have the capability and the quantification to process it? There are two ways of doing it, whether you process it rock or you do it in brine. Both of them are being explored. There are issues of environment. There are issues of security for all of us who, op who operated in the JNK. And it's, 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 it's a little complex maze. So how we go about it, how we navigate is a question of time. A lot of work is going into it, and that suffice for me to tell you. Next, please. Then you're looking at chemicals. Look at the entire chemical supply chain. Now, chemicals is not only this, these famous chemicals that I've just listed out here on a slide, aluminum, 
you know, uh, and antibody and these minerals and these, you know, chemicals like hydrochloric acid and ethanol and acetone, they're just a small little tip of an iceberg. They're nearly 150 of them. The problem is something different. The problem is how do you store them? Are they pyrotoxic? What is their shelf life? What is their logistics? How do they move from place to place to? Obviously, these chemicals and gases cannot move by air, so you require a seaport. No point for guessing at what's happening in the sands, only AT&T and not a fan. It doesn't have a port. But what's happening in Gujarat and possibly what will happen in Orissa is because they have ports and not airports. But then there are minerals for which you require logistics for an airport. So when you look at the overall picture, it is a very complex picture of infrastructure, speciality, distribution, warehousing, national logistics corridors, and all of that. So when you look at Gati Shakti, when you look at the national logistics policy, which has just been released last year, all of this falls into place. So there is a method in the madness. Suffice for me to tell you, a lot of work is going into this. Next, please. Then you come into the gases. Now, gases is another very, very important aspect. Uh, well, to just give you an example, uh, one of the most important gases in the process is neon. And neon was being produced by Ukraine. Nearly 40% of it was being produced by Ukraine till 2022. And they produce this, uh, this neon gas as a byproduct of the steel industry. Now, you have a great steel industry. A lot of people ask me and ask a lot of people to ask you, oh, why didn't you think of it? Why didn't you produce this? Well, there was no market. There was no business case. You like it or you don't like it, the corporate functions on business. If there is no business case, that's the story the way it is. It's the same story a lot of people will tell you and a lot of people will say that, oh, we missed the bus. No, you didn't miss the bus. You didn't. You started the semiconductor laboratory in Mohali in 1983. ESMC came into being in 1987 with the chronology. And then there was a massive fire in the semiconductor laboratory in 1989. It was cut it down. Nobody knows how it happened. And then, lo and behold, in 1991, the economy opened under the Nasimha Rao's regime. And when it opened, whatever you could get outside for two rupees, there was no business sense to build it here for 25 rupees. So there was not an astute business case. And if there was no business case, that's not the way the business works. So you never missed any board. You just understood that you could do something better by not putting in that much of money inside here. Well, till the time COVID happened and everything else got stretched. And then when you went to your, your dealer to buy a car, he told you, look, it will take you one and a half years. A Tesla has 1,540 chips. A javelin has 200 of them, all made by TSMC, by the way. So then, thereafter, you went to the bank, and the bank told you, oh, the credit card will take four months to come, because that low-end chip is not available. So that is how you realize that, look, the time has now come to move away, not only from the strategic sector, but also to the other system. Next, please. Services, of course. You have the ATMPs and FABs, and uh, these ATMP and supply chain services are going to be your mainstay. Three of them have already been announced by the government of India. The first one in Micron last July, and two more now, one in Sanan, and uh, the other one also now in Morigaon, Assam. So there may be more of them, so because the, the moment your fabs come up, it makes more sense to get your ATMP and your packaging and your OSAT facilities in-house than to send them abroad somewhere, because that again takes a lot of money. And then, of course, there's a turnaround time, and there are disruptions and all of that. So it has been very astutely thought through by the government of India as to how the new mosaic is going to be in the next around five to seven years. Secondly, when you're looking at these services, you are not looking at a very high end skill set. You're looking at a large number of people getting employment also as part of this high tech system. Uh, also gives a large amount of social metric exposure. I will. Uh, make it a point to tell you about uh, how the Tata Electronics, I was somebody, no names, very senior some time ago, the Tata Electronics, they had this new factory in Krishnagiri, back down in Tamil Nadu. 75% of the flow workers are women. They are tribals. Look at the sociometric change, it is transformational. The same thing is going to happen now in Assam, the same thing will happen in Sangam. 
So that is how when you, and unlike the fab, which is more automated, more robotic, more precision oriented, more team room based, more process based, less manpower based, the APMP and the packaging facilities are more manpower intensive. So it gives not only the employment, it gives you the added leeway for packing and the, doing the packaging for chips from abroad from the other foundries so that you become a valuable part of the overall global value chain. This has to be understood. Next please. Now look at this Indian semiconductor opportunity. Your large electronics market, your median age is 25 years and some months or 27 years and some months. At 27 years or something, this gives rise to aspirations. Everybody wants a swanky phone, everybody wants a nice car, everybody wants everything. So by around 2030, your electronics market is going to be 300 billion. You're the second largest or third largest automobile market in the world. You tip Japan to be the third largest one. You have a young population, as I just mentioned to you. Semiconductor talent, you churn off 1.5 billion engineers every year. Semicon design potential, 21% of the designers of the world are sitting here in India. So when you have that design potential, you also have to understand the S2 business case. In a fabrication facility, the margins of profit are between 10 to 8 to 10 percent. In a design or a fabless system, the profits are 40 percent. It's four times. So whether you want to only press on the design potential or you want to move into fabs was a question which a lot of uh, people have been lurking around with. But then, since you have an entire ecosystem which can push the design prowess in the country, which designs for the world, well, that's the way we are going to be moving forward. Your engineering and manufacturing cap capabilities are, are increasing by the day. Your policies are very aggressive. You should look at the design link intensive, the production link incentive, the specs one, now coming on with specs 2.0. There's something called chips to start up, there's called in chip. Uh, the the uh, the uh, countries today boasts of the second largest internet uh, you know uh, subscribers in the world. It also looks at the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. While a lot of people may, may say that uh, you know that you have 1.4 billion people and oh you have only made 117 unicorns as you know, it's, it's fancy to give out these figures. But well, it's a it's it's a case in question. You must understand that today's startups will be tomorrow's MSMEs, and tomorrow's MSMEs will be day after those corporations. So it's not a it's not a magic wand. That's the way it functions all over the world, and that is what exactly what is being done. Next, please. These are the market metrics. You can look at it. Uh, bulk goes into automotive. You are looking at a hundred three billion. Uh, dollars opportunity sometime around 2030. It is estimated insofar as the semiconductor markets are concerned. The automotive still remains the biggest chunk in all of that. This is an uh, estimation. When you see E on the bar chart, it is an estimated till today, uh, say around 2023. That is what you are in. That is where you're going to be. Obviously, your markets are very, very big in terms of the consumer electronics automotive, wearables, and now defense and aerospace. That is also increasing by the day. Next, please. So let's crystal gaze 2030. What is the story of 2030? We're looking at the equipment uh, market, which should be around $200 billion worldwide. You're looking at the materials market of $150 billion. You're looking at services of $200 billion. So where are we? We are looking at around 15 to 18% of the pie in equipment market. The equipment we will not be able to make, but yes, we will make a large amount of components for the system and consumables for the preventive maintenance of these equipments. This is already the work in progress. When you're looking at materials, there's a large preference uh, and presence of the Indian firms and tenancies today in India. We are looking at around 10 to 12 percent of the market by around 2030. And services, we are looking at 20 to 22 percent of the market by around 2030, which possibly would be somewhere edging closer to China by around 2030. 
by leveraging the large and strong talent. So this is a very, very important aspect which a lot of people are looking at and we should be out of the overall metrics of around you know, 550 billion or nearly you know, 600 billion, we should be looking at around 85 to 100 billion dollars as far as the Indians are concerned. So this is, looks like a chart for crystal gazing in 2030 and more or less it should be more than this as I see it on the ground as I interact with six or seven states that I deal with, with various central government agencies, with various policy making bodies and the PMO. So a lot of work in, is in progress insofar as these three things are concerned. The third part, whether you're looking at the large talent pool that we are looking at, this is going to be the Icalis seal of everybody all over the world, talent, and talent like vaccines could be weaponized. So you are the talent factory of the world and you will be the talent capital of the world. So how we do this, whether we merge the hard skills with the soft skills, whether we get a lot of experience, whether they are JVs, whether they are or various collaborations in fact there's work in progress the AICT has already tweaked the syllabus on the LSI for a lot of uh, colleges last year there are BTECs now in the LSI it's all over the place the lower segment of technicians is also being addressed in the various ITIs and various skill development uh, institutions so there's a lot of work in progress insofar as this is concerned next so let's look at the Indian snapshot we look at the strengths we have a robust chemical industry, we have a steady talent flow, we have access to the full design cycle, 21% of the designers of the world. We have a robust policy framework. Let me also add and put it on record. When you look at the Indian policy paradigm today in this sector, I think it's the best in class in the world. It's been very thought through with multi-stakeholder uh, you know, inputs. It has been really thought through, very well driven, and very well oiled. Then you're looking at availability of infrastructure for component manufacturing, in which your strength lies. Your strength lies in the MSMEs. MSMEs are your backbone. You catalyze these MSMEs, and you see the magic. And then, of course, you have the enabling government policies in various states and centers which stack up well opportunities. We have the Indian diaspora. Most of the CEOs, CXOs, all presidents, vice presidents, or most semiconductor and high-tech companies all over the world are Indians. There's a volatile geopolitical landscape. I will not dwell more on that. You're all aware, you're more knowledgeable than I am. You know what I mean. Emerging technologies is the order of the day. India is a part of that. You have a great demographic dividend, which I've already spoken to you. And the most important, you have significant local demand. Everything spins from demand. If you have demand, things will move. If you don't have demand, nothing will move. That's the way the world works. And anybody who says that, you know, it doesn't work like that, and it works in a very different manner, that's more academic. This is how it works on the ground. And of course, you have massive uh, international collaborations, which are the order of the And these international collaborations are going to be driving a large amount of your uh, JVs, a large amount of your you know, uh, multi stakeholder engagements, a large amount of your skilling, etc. etc. ISET is an example with the United States. You have in the MOU with Japan. Uh, there are two more MOUs in waiting. I shall not say so which uh, the government is working on and of course there's a lot of you know uh, internal and external training facilities which are being extended by India and other foreign countries. Weaknesses, of course we have to look at the weaknesses, nothing goes without the side as two points. You have low linkages with fabs, you don't have very many fabs, you only have the SCL so there's a low linkage, there's a need for a fab floor experience of people who need to go and take this experience that is that is a weakness. You have a weak R&D focus. A lot of people also tell you, you know, that R&D is a function of all oh, the brains and it's a very cerebral outlook and, you know, it has, it has a lot of things with the, uh, you know, the academy and all of that. No, R&D is a function of money. It's as simple as that. Your R&D is directly proportional to the amount of money you put in. So while India has around $48 billion of R&D focus, as the uh, Gantt report which puts it, the Americans have $146 billion. So there's a huge gap to fill. But then there are other issues at hand. 
when you, you have a large population, there, there are other things at hand. But be that as it may, the government in place is looking at this very, very astutely, and there's a lot of money which is going to be coming into now this R and D domain, especially for the critical technologies of the semiconductors. And the third part is you may say that you have 1.5 million engineers whom you are churning out every year, but where is the faculty? Who will teach them? They can't be going abroad and get taught. So there's an issue of faculty development in which we are looking at now industry veterans stepping in, doing the needful, and various other issues are being considered. IP regime, there is a problem in IP regime. Uh, we are, uh, at the end of the day, very service centric. We need to be product centric. A product will give you an IP. An IP reigns supreme in whatever you do in the world. And of course, the talent management, you may have a large amount of talent, but how do you amalgamate soft skills and hard skills? How do you, you know, cater for rural and urban divide? How do you cater for more women in the workplace? How do you ensure women don't leave the workplace to increase the labor force participation rate in the country? These are all challenges and weaknesses that we have. Next. So in continuum, there's a great Indian semiconductor policy of December 2021, tweaked in October 2022, beautifully and massive amount of impetus on the state policies in the semiconductor space. There is going to be the Bharat Semiconductor Research Laboratory, which is going to be coming up as part of the semiconductor laboratory in Mohali, which has been running up and running since 1983 in spite of that fire in 1989, and is still making a large amount of things for your space programs. Uh, there are enabling schemes, there's setting up of fabs, 18 units by JV consortium approach, you've already seen three. I was a part of them, I was in Dolera on the 13th of March for the groundbreaking of the Tata Fab. Uh, setting up of certification and quantification labs is one of the most important things that we, uh, which is a challenge which lies ahead of us, that we're looking at it. We are putting in the industry, academy, and government all brains together to get the certification and quantification going so that you don't have to go abroad for the foreign agencies to certify that you are good or you are bad. Then you're looking at supply chain plugging and dynamics and leveraging the existing chemical industry prowess. I mentioned to you, you are already making a large amount of bulk chemicals, some specialty chemicals are also being made. Now, how you get it from parts per million to parts per billion is a challenge and also the issues of its distribution, logistics, shelf life, carriage, pyrotoxic understanding, safety, security, and all of that. So it's, a, it's a complex procedure, but there's work in progress on that. Future ready scaling force, I already mentioned to you, there's a lot of emphasis on alternate technologies, which is the silicon carbide and the cadmium nitride. The government is doing its very best on that also, because it also brings a large amount of impetus on a low carbon footprint. So when you look at it, the Indian advantage is that most of the fabrication facilities all over the world were made in the late 90s and early 2000s. That is time there was no SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. There was nothing like that. There were no green processes. Now, since you're building these great structures bottoms up, you're already putting them and plugging that into the policies so that you'll be using that famous renewable energy prowess of yours. You'll be using you know, water which will be recycled especially that water recycling and stress, water stress areas and all of that. And then building these things wonderfully. Aligning the endeavor for dual use applications is something because, uh, you know, you can be making something for a particular sector, but if you do not endeavor from the very beginning for a dual use purpose, then you will only be modifying this at some stage, right? which may not be giving you a very optimum solution. So that is, a, is, is an aspect which a lot of us need to consider, and this requires an interministerial understanding of the issue, which we are looking at very, very uh, focused, in a very focused manner, and we are doing that. So a lot of people, especially who are the people like Department of Space, Ministry of Defense, a lot of other people also get on with it. We want a point that Sometime when your fabs are up and running after two, two and a half years, and you are churning out what you are doing, it shouldn't happen. Then we have a, another issue at hand to modify what you are making today and say, oh, can we do this for this also? Strategic investments is a function of money. They are coming in. The one big ticket comes, it catalyzes MSME. You catalyze MSME in this country, you see the magic. It's as simple as that. My only submission to most of you is, 
went the war before the war. 